Good afternoon. Welcome. It's great to see all of you here today. My name is TJ Hicks. I'm the program coordinator here at the library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our beautiful library and observatory for a great program this afternoon. Uh, just a quick reminder, make sure you turn off your cell phone. Uh, and then I also want to let people know that we've got some other great programming coming up. So. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to pick up one of our program guides uh, or sign up for our updates, our email updates via our website. Um, Thursday, we've got uh, Seth Rudetsky, who is the author of Musical Theater for Dummies, coming in. That's one of our premier programs through our Rancho Mirage Writers Festival, so the first 200 people here will receive a free copy of his book. Uh, I do want to remind people that as a premier program, Rancho Mirage residents and donors to Library Foundation receive priority seating, so keep that in mind. Um, but it should be a great event, and I encourage you to get here early if you're interested. Um, but with that, we want to go ahead and get started today. So I'm going to turn things over to our partners. Uh, and this has been great, uh, first couple lectures that we have done with Ollie. And so let me introduce Jody. Hello. I'm Jody with Ollie. Um, Ollie is an acronym, acronym that is for Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We're on the campus at CSUSB, um, that's Cal State University, San Bernardino, on Cook Street. And we offer adult education at university level, but there's no grades, there's no homework, and there's no stress. Um, we're just about to start our six week series, and um, we have. Um, classes such as interna international document uh, cinema, classical music virtuoso, and uh, the art of the Colterra, and paintings with acrylics. So we have in-person classes and Zoom classes. Now before I get a big boo on Zoom, um, Zoom has really progressed. <laughs> so it's not, it's not the Zoom of, of COVID times. It's, we're very advanced, and our classrooms are all smart classrooms. Um, so I am in the back. If you'd like to come get a brochure, and I have a 10% off d discount coupon card. And also, um, Carrie Berman, who's our speaker today, is going to be speaking on our campus. And you don't have to be a member of OLLI to join us. It's going to be at the Elephant, which is the main, our main auditorium there. And it's going to be January 8th from 1 to 3, and it's two hours instead of one. So thank you all for coming, and I'd like to introduce to you our Ollie instructor and friend, Carrie Berman. What a blessing. This is really so special to be able to share with you. You guys made a major sacrifice. We have two seasons here. We have heaven and we have hell. <laughs> and in October, we go to heaven, and then around June, we go to you know where. So to be here inside when it's so gorgeous outside, um, I appreciate you attending. Um, my name is Kerry. I am hearing impaired. I live in Sun City, Palm Desert, uh, doing lectures and, and doing uh, tours and being hearing impaired is perfect because if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I'll pretend like I didn't hear you. <laughs> so that works out real good. Um, uh, my hearing compliments of uh, Vietnam. I was a radio operator and a tunnel rat uh, for eight months on the front lines, but I gotta tell you, VA is wonderful. They have really taken good care of us veterans. So, you know, on the screen, this is kind of unusual. This, how many people know what bird this is? Okay. It is a snowbird. It is, <laughs> it is a fenipepala. There's not many birds that I'm aware of that during heaven in October, they come from the coast and they fly over here and then they make a nest in an acacia or a mesquite, and they have a baby, and they eat the little desert mistletoe berries, and then come the end of April, they adios, go back over to the coast, make another nest, 
have another little baby. So I thought the Fenipepla is just perfect to welcome our snowbirds back. And uh, so if you see, now you know um, about our very famous bird. Enchanted Valley Palm Springs and beyond. You know, I, I just absolutely am thrilled to, to live in the desert. I, I during, you know, uh, during hell, I try to adios and get, get off campus from Sun City. Uh, but uh, I came here in 1973. I was one of the youngest real estate brokers in the Valley and I retired in 06. And I started volunteering at all these different places and they say, can you do lectures? Can you do tours? And I thought, wow, this is wonderful. So 16 years later, the two greatest blessings that I think any of us could have, number one is family, and number two, to be blessed to pursue your passion. And that's where I'm at. So Enchanted Valley, uh, because of my desire to preserve uh, conserve and educate, I wrote this book. The proceeds go to the Palm Springs Historical Society and Oswit Land Trust. So we're, we're involved in preservation, thank you, education and appreciation of the Sonoran Desert, which we're in. So today we're gonna go on a journey. We're gonna go on a journey starting up in Yucca Valley in Pioneer Town and we're gonna go all the way down to Salvation Mountain. Uh, so this, my, my, my editor and my layout gal, they're so good. They were wonderful. Uh, having, well, having dropped out of high school when I was 15, I'm not the best when it comes to like grammar and that type of thing. So my editor was wonderful. And then my layout lady, she put these little road runners. So you just follow the road runner all the way down to Salvation Mountain. And every chapter, I elaborate on the different places that we're going. This is typically like a two hour program. So it's gonna be like a one hour high octane. Can you hear me okay in the back? Good, okay. So being uh, hearing impaired, uh, So we start off at Pioneer Town. How many people have been to Pioneer Town in Yucca Valley? Wow, fantastic. So for those of us who haven't been there, it was developed in 1946 by Sons of the Pioneers. And it's a real motion picture set. All of the, it's not like a facade. All of the buildings have a utility value. So um, when the, when Roy Rogers, well no, Gene Autry, when Gene Autry introduced uh, Roy Cohen, the, the head of Columbia Pictures to the 32,000 acre pioneer town, he said this would be a great place. You could save money and film your Western movies and TV shows, etc. So they, today, you know, Pappy and Harriet's used to be a, a burrito biker bar. And uh, so now many famous people come and they have gunfights. They have gunfights on the weekends, on Saturdays and Sundays. You have to check to make sure they're, they're still doing it. So the, uh, the museum up in Yucca Valley, the High Desert Museum, anything you want to know about the Sonoran Desert and our indigenous people, um, Chimahuevos, the uh, Cahuillas, the uh, Serranos, um, and uh, the flora, the fauna, this museum is fantastic. I'll bet you almost everybody in the room has been to Joshua Tree, Joshua Tree National Park. Thank goodness for a little old lady from Pasadena, Minerva Hoyt, Minerva in 1936, she was into horticulture and she would come out to the desert and she loved 
to see all of the cactus and the desert plants. So if you're going up Highway 62 to Morongo and the Yucca, on the left-hand side, just opposite Desert Hot Springs, is Devil's Garden. In 1914, they opened up the Panama Canal, and the influx of people into Los Angeles was pretty huge. Consequently, impressive exhibit that Franklin Delano Roosevelt got wind of, and so in the 1930s, in 1936, because of Minerva Hoyt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created Joshua Tree National Monument. It wasn't until 1994 that President Clinton signed it into Joshua Tree National Park, which is the highest level of, you know, uh, wildlands conservancy that you can reach. So, oh, the the fire, the fire in Joshua Tree, or in Joshua Tree. This, when we get flash floods and the lightning strikes, used to burn like five, ten acres. Now, 2006, because of all the invasive grasses, over 60,000 plus acres from Joshua Tree past Pioneer Town burned in the Sawtooth Fire. So invasives are not real healthy. Morongo, the Morongo Preserve is now back open after Hurricane Hillary. Uh, if you're into birding, if you have uh, difficulty mobility-wise, uh, like walkers or scooters, they have fabulous, easy-to-maneuver paths for scooters, for walkers, and it's great for children. Uh, it's one of the number one birding destinations uh, in North America, the Morongo Valley Preserve. So they, after Hillary, they had a lot of damage, but a lot of people stepped up and helped them out. So those are the paths there that you see. It's real easy to maneuver. This is Devil's Garden. You see on the left side what it looked like, and that's Mount San Gorgonio uh, on your right, 11,503 feet above sea level. Takes about eight to 10 years for that snow melt to percolate into the Morongo Basin to the Mission Springs Aquifer and Desert Hot Springs. So if any of you are like manic depressive, bipolar, or know somebody that is, uh, drink a lot of water out of Desert Hot Springs because there's lithium bicarbonate in the water which is a very popular prescription for people that, every one of us has lithium in our bodies. Some of us burn it up quicker. So the mineral content, eight to 10 years to percolate through all that granitic material, some of the best tasting drinking water in the world. I'll elaborate in a minute. Whitewater, how many people been up to Whitewater? Fabulous place. In the 1930s, it used to be a trout farm. In 2006, the Wildlands Conservancy took it over. You know, the Pacific Crest Trail from Canada all the way down to Mexico, about 2,600 and some odd miles, goes right through Whitewater. When you visit there, the trout, the uh, rainbow trout, we used to have catch and release for the kids that were under 15, but there's a lot of ranger guided hikes fabulous trails up there, and now you know that President Obama, he passed the Sand to Snow Monument. So we've got one more monument coming up that's going to be contiguous to Joshua Tree National Park. It's called the Chuckawalla National Monument. Hopefully the president, within the next year, will sign into law. That means that the entire valley, we're only the one valley in the entire United States that's surrounded by San Jacinto, Santa Rosa Monument, San Jose National Monument, Joshua Tree National Park, and Chuckawalla National Monument. So we have a corridor for all of the eagle, eagles, all the animals to be able to uh, transition to the different places they need to go. So uh, On our right-hand side there, uh, you'll see about halfway up, a lot of times you'll see in the morning the Nelson Bighorn sheep, a lot of sheep up there. During the summer, you can take your, your kids or your grandchildren 
to Whitewater, and there's a, a wonderful pool that's free that they can enjoy, and the water comes from Mount San Gregorio in the San Bernardino Mountains. Oh, this is interesting. The San Gregorio Pass, the wind farms, you know, this is a biggie. Remember back in the 70s when gasoline prices were just astronomical. The oil embargo in the Middle East, we had to pay 35 to 40 cents a gallon. No, nobody could afford that. So they, 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 the government said, we got to look at renewables. So in 1980, that's when really the wind turbines took off in the past. We had over 4,000 wind turbines. Today, we have approximately 1,200 producing the same amount of electricity as the 4,000 plus. Enough for about 245,000 homes from wind energy. And then we have solar panels out there uh, and they're putting up, if you go out there now, they're putting up huge, huge storage batteries because that's uh, the real challenge or one of the major challenges with renewables. They have to go directly into the transmission lines. You have to use it like your car, direct current. It's not AC. So if we can store the energy, then that's a major hurdle that we've overcome. So the wind farms out there, you see on the right-hand side of the wind, we used to have wind surfing out there. That's the Coachella Valley Water District's replenishment ponds. So we get the water from the Colorado River, white water opens up, goes into those ponds up there, and it percolates into our Coachella Valley aquifer. I don't know if anybody enjoys date shakes, but I've, I've been to Mecca, uh, the Oasis, and I've been to Shields, and I can tell you that the windmill market has gotten several write-ups in Sunset Magazine for the best date shakes in the valley. You look at the outside of it on Indian Avenue, right near Dillon, it looks kind of like a dump. You go inside there, you get your date shake with the real ice cream and the medjool dates, and then you go out into the back patio, and it looks kind of like Hawaii with all these flora and fauna, it's, I mean flora. So windmill market's really cool. This guy, Cabot Yerxa, 1913, he comes out here, gets off at Garnet at Indian and I-10, and hikes north. He goes north about seven miles, and he eventually builds a homestead, and he's going into Garnet once or twice a week to get water. The Native American Kauia says, Cabot, you got water right underneath your property. So he goes down, he digs a well approximately 40 feet. He hits 132 degree geothermal water, hot water aquifer. Then he looks down the valley and where Bubbling Wells Ranch is located just below Miracle Hill, he sees all of this flora, all the plants. And he goes, it can't grow in 132 degree water. So he went down about 600 yards. He digs another well, hits cold water. So he hit the hot water geothermal aquifer on the North American tectonic plate. We're on the Pacific plate, so we have the greatest therapeutic hot and cold water, best tasting drinking water in the world. I'll elaborate in a minute. And his donkey, that's Merry Christmas. He bought her for $10. His first marriage, uh, they had one son, Rodney, and after about a year or so, um, his first wife said, Cabot, you know, this is not really what I uh, I'm looking forward to. So he split, or she split. So Cabot, almost single-handedly, he built uh, the Cabot Yerkes Museum. This is fascinating. He, he used scrap material from the Southern Pacific Railroad that was built in 1876. He used homestead material. 
Uh, he used material that the uh, Metropolitan Water District, when they were creating the Colorado River Aqueduct, the canal, in 1933, he got materials from them, and he built this. He put like one cup of cement in the mortar, and that's it's withstanded all this time since 1941 until he passed away in 1965. So, and then on the right-hand side, for many of you people that are snowbirds and you go home, Peter Toth, the sculpture er that made Waioki, that's friendly, friendly, means like friendly person. Waioki, Peter, he sculptured every one of those uh, different sculptures, wood sculptures, in every state in the United States. He came back here about 10 years ago and kind of uh, rehabbed this one. So it's Waioki's friendly helper. That's what that means. This is how the hot and cold water happened. You look at underneath on Miracle Hill, it used to be called Eagle's Nest when Cabot first got out there. So he digs down on Eagle's Nest. He hits the geothermal water. Then he looks down valley, like I mentioned. He digs another well, hits coal. So they, he called that Miracle Hill. Has anybody been to Two Bunch Palms? Two Bunch Palms. One of the most unique, one of the most historical, holistic health resorts in the world. That is a pretty big statement. I've been doing historical walks and nature walks for two bunch now for nine years. The Mission Creek branch of the San Andreas Fault runs directly under two bunch palms and under desert hot springs on the North American tectonic plate. That's the only community in the desert that's on the North American tectonic plate. We're on the Pacific tectonic plate here. So there's a story about Al Capone. And I'm not gonna finish the story about Al Capone and the Italian mafia. I'll tell you this, Al Capone was never ever there. From 1932 to 1935, he was in Georgia, penitentiary. From 1935 to about 1940, he was in Alcatraz. He passed away, they let him out in the 1940s. He died from syphilis. It wasn't the Italian mafia that was responsible for the development of Two Bunch Palms. It was a purple gang. It was a Jewish mafia. I won't elaborate on that now because I don't have time, but Two Bunch is, that is the most biologically diverse health resort in the world. If you can tell me one other resort on 277 acres in the world that you never have to leave for food, for clothing, for building materials, for medicine, nothing. You can live on that 277 acres. We only have 77 acres improved. So the other 200 are open space. Mount San Jacinto in the background, the views are absolutely incredible from Two Bunch. 1939, guy by the name of Thomas Lips, Thomas and Billy, they own the Hotel Del Taquitz in Palm Springs in the 1930s and 1940s, and they were friends with a guy by the name of Al Werthemer from the Purple Gang who moved out here in 1934 and said to Nellie Kaufman, who's a matriarch of Palm Springs, said, Nellie, I'm gonna build a casino here. And Nellie, not only is a matriarch of Palm Springs, but she was the mayor, the planning commission, the city council, etc. You didn't do anything unless you ran it by Nellie. So Al Werthemer says, Nellie, I'm gonna build a casino here. She says, not in our village, you're not. 
So he goes next door to Cathedral City off of Date Palm, and he builds the most exclusive casino in the valley called the Dunes Club. So Al Werthemer and Al Capone, some of the mobsters got the last name screwed up because Al Werthemer from the Purple Gang was the catalyst that Thomas Lips, who owned the Hotel Del Taquitz, was friends with Al Werthemer, and he said, I'm going north, and I'm going to build a casino. And he built a casino, which is a restaurant today, and downstairs was a brothel. Okay. So we have a picture today of Palm Springs. That slide on the right. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. That picture has never been taken in 4.5 billion years until last January. A lady traveling along the I-10 coming into Palm Springs looked off to her right, Mount San Jacinto, and she sees an avalanche. That was in January. And uh, how she captured that, just below that is Snow Creek, so it didn't get down as far as the valley floor. That avalanche is on an escarpment that's the steepest vertical mountain in the United States. No other mountain range is that steep. So that's Mount San Jacinto. The Palm Springs Aerial Tram, that was Crocker's Folly. Francis Crocker was an engineer, and he and Carl Burkow were going to a Kiwanis meeting in Banning in 1935. So uh, Francis, he says, Carl, wouldn't it be cool to be able to get out of the heat and go up to the top of the mountain? And for 28 years, until 1963, they called it Crocker's Folly. And in 1963, the five towers, the tram was completed, and it's the longest single span tram. It's like going from Mexico to Alaska in like 12 minutes, and I know most of you have been on it before, and it rotates two and a half times. And some of my colleagues, uh, they've hiked up to the top of Mount San Jacinto. Anytime I get an urge to do that, I lay down till it goes away. But <laughs> there was a lot of famous people that were responsible for uh, the development of the tram. And it's, you know, it's like 30 degrees cooler. And then during the summer, you buy a summer pass, very inexpensive, and then you can go up there as much as you want. And if you're a veteran, uh, they have Veterans Day where you go for free and you can bring your family. Looking down from the aerial tram at night and during the day, beautiful. Dr. Wellwood Murray, Wellwood Murray Cemetery. You know, McCallum, McCallum, uh, Judge McCallum, he comes here in 1884 because his son Johnny, his oldest son Johnny, has tuberculosis. So this was kind of a, a very good area. If you have respiratory problems, you need warm, you know, dry heat. So McCallum comes here with his three sons and his two daughters and his wife. And in 1884, in 1885, the Native American Kahuyas, they build the McCallum Adobe. And then Judge McCallum, he acquires about 6,000 acres of land, mainly from the Southern Pacific Railroad for $2.50 an acre. So he's the largest landowner, and he wants to create a farming community because you can take the crops to market a month or two earlier than anywhere else in the country. So. Doctor, I mean, uh, Judge McCallum calls up his friend, Dr. Murray, in Banning. And he says, Dr. Murray, I need a place for the people to stay when I have this auction. So can you come out here and build a hotel? So the moral of the story is this. Judge McCallum was not a judge. They nicknamed him Judge McCallum. He was an attorney. Dr. Murray was not a doctor. During the Civil War, he patched up a lot of the injured, so they called him Doc Murray. 
So Judge McCallum, who wasn't a judge, calls Dr. Murray, who wasn't a doctor, to come to the village, which really was nothing. <laughs> and Willwood, he builds the Palm Springs Hotel, right on Tuck, it used to be Tuckwish McCallum and Palm Canyon, in between Palm Canyon and Indian. So that's the story. Ah, here we go. Now, we've got the, the new development taking place. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. On the far right, we have Norma Jean. We have Norma Jean, who was discovered at the racket club in the 1930s, 1940s. Marilyn Monroe is over there in the far right corner. We have a malfunction that's taking place with Norma Jean now in Palm Springs, okay? The art museum, you'll notice when you go there, it's built underground because the zoning, there was height limitations at one time. So if you have a lot of money, like the Hyatt, like the Rowan, um, there's exceptions. <laughs> so we have the art museum here and then, as you exit the art museum, you know, on Thursday night, we have Village Fest. It's free. They close off Palm Canyon for almost two miles, and we have all of, I'll talk to the, about that in a minute. But the malfunction that we have now is you exit the museum, and you see Maryland's buttocks. <laughs> this is not a good thing. So the, the desire is to please just Keep her here, but relocate her just a little bit away so that when you exit the museum, you don't have to look, you know, at her buttocks. So um, there, that's an ongoing thing. Uh, here we have the Village Fest, and you can see right between Marilyn's legs, there's a museum. <laughs> Folks, we have waited years and years and years. Many of us have spent a lot of money going to the Agua Caliente canyons to raise money to build this cultural museum for the Agua Caliente. This is going to be one of the most popular indigenous people's destinations in the world. The Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians, they thought of everything. They're going to open this up come November the 3rd. It's going to be, I believe, the grand opening. We got kind of delayed because of, of uh, COVID. But now they're going to open this up in November. And they thought about people that couldn't go to Andreas Canyon or Murray Canyon or Palm Canyon in the Indian Canyons. So outside of the building, they replicated Andreas Canyon. So if you have walkers or scooters, uh, you have challenges, and you can't go into the regular canyons, you can go to the Cultural Museum and, and, and see what it's like to walk through a Palm Oasis, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So that's, that's coming in a couple weeks. Nellie Kaufman, uh, you know, Nellie, Ray, Ray was, Ray is here, his, his parents, his grandparents, uh, they were in Palm Desert way, way before Palm Desert was ever Palm Desert. Uh, but Nellie Kaufman and her sister, uh, Nellie Kaufman, Cornelia White and Flora, Dr. Florella White, her and her sister, in 1912, they were in Mexico. Pancho Villa, there was a revolution. So the Americans had to get out. So Cornelia White and uh, Florella White, they came to Palm Springs. And they eventually bought Wellwood Murray's Palm Springs Hotel. And Wellwood built this home in 1893 out of a defunct railroad that went from Smoke Tree along Farrell to Garnet. There was a railroad there, a narrow gauge railroad, that went for about two months and then it went defunct. So Wellwood collected all the railroad ties and material and he, he built the house on the left. The McCallum Adobe, Pearl, his last surviving daughter, she 
uh, moved the McCallum Adobe, which is now the Palm Springs Historical Society, to the Village Green, where maybe one day we'll, we'll have Frank Bogart, his statue, back up again where it belongs. But that, they moved it brick by brick from the Palm Springs Oasis Hotel that Pearl McCallum McManus and Austin McManus built in 1925. So uh, that used to be in the parking lot right off of Taquish McCallum Way. Taquish, very sacred place. During the 60s, it turned into a nudist colony. Uh, people were very disrespectful to this property. It's very, very important to the Native Americans. And so for a long time, you know, because there was graffiti and a lot of drugs and people were running amok, uh, they closed it down. But quite a few years back, you know, in the early 2000s, they opened up again. So if you're going into Taquish to go to the falls, which is a 60 foot waterfall, it's a cardio. It's not an easy hike, but they have ranger led hikes there. They have short films about the history of Taquish. So this is a very sacred area for the Native Americans. And you won't see any palms in there because the California fan palm has to have its head in the sun and its feet in the water. And there's too much shade and it doesn't run 24 seven, 365 anymore. Only when it rains heavy do we get the water running, which is running right now. So that's the fall, and that's the visitor center. And then Morton's Botanical Garden. Uh, this is a very special place to me. Being the founder of Temple Sinai of the Desert back in 1976, I met my wife, who was a church secretary at Desert Chapel, so when I went to lunch with the rabbi, I say, Rabbi, I'm falling in love with this girl. She's not Jewish. And he says, does she have good character, good morals? I said, yes. Everything was yes. So at the end of lunch, he says, what, what are you looking for? A year later, I say, Rabbi, I got it. We got married at Morton's Botanical Garden by Judge Robinson because Pastor Morrill wouldn't marry us. And... Rabbi Silverman wouldn't marry us, so, but our parents showed up. So that's what it looked like back in March of 1978. <laughs> and then this Andreas Canyon, that's, that's my favorite canyon. I mean, the flora, the fauna, the geology, the water, it is absolutely, I could spend three, four hours just walking. I take the colonists from Smoke Tree Ranch and we go on a field trip there and it is fascinating. And then you have Palm Canyon. Over 15 miles of California fan palms, Washingtonian filifera. You know, our California fan palm, if you can hug the palm, any palm you see out there, if you can get your arms around it, it wasn't born here. The Washingtonian filifera, the California fan palm, is the only palm native to California. And depending on what book you read, to the continental United States. So the Washingtonian filifera, the California fan palm, was named by a German horticulturalist over in Europe in the 1890s. He sees them growing in a hothouse. He names it Washingtonian after George and filifera because there's a lot of fiber and thread on the palm fronds that the Native Americans use. So they build their kish, three to four people would live in there, and then an old man, Mole, M-O-U-L, he was ready to pass away. He wanted to leave something for his people, so he stood very s still near the water, and he turned into a Washingtonian filifera. <laughs> and then the Air Museum, we know it's one of the best in the United States. My life expectancy coming out of the back of the chopper, if you Google radio operator Vietnam, five seconds. And on the right there, we use the medevac, the CH-34, to medevac our wounded and our, the ones that will never come back. The stealth just recently 
went on display about a year, year and a half, two years ago. There's Washingtonian Philippera. Skirt goes down to the ground. Native Americans, first thing they did, burn the skirts. Why? Because they didn't want the little critters that grew in the skirts to get into their food source. Because it's a monocot, it's part of the grass family, the lily family, it doesn't have age rings like a diacot. So the moral of the story, as long as the crown at the top of the California fan palm is intact, it will continue to grow. And then the following year is a little palm fruit, tastes a little bit like a date, but the palm fruit is high in carbohydrate. So this was an indication to the Native Americans that there was water at the surface within about eight to 10 feet maximum because that's how deep the root ball is. Oh, I want to go back. How did all of these palms that need so much water, how are they able to survive out here? Because of the fine sediment that we have and the San Andreas Fault and all of the tectonic plate movement, we have fault gouge and very fine sediment. When it hits the water, it's like, it's like flour. When you put water on the flour, you know, it beads off. But when you stir it around, it turns into a dough. So when the water from the Peninsula mountain range, San Jacinto, Santa Rosa, or the San Gorgonio, when the water bearing strata comes into the valley, hits the fault gouge, hits the sediment, it creates a natural clay pipe, an impervious, like a PVC pipe, natural clay pipe. Consequently, when the tectonic plates shift, boom, the water hits an impervious layer and goes up to the surface, creating the Coachella Valley Preserve, the palms that you see all along the Indio Hills. And in the Coachella Valley Preserve right now, it's shut down because of Hurricane Hillary, but it's got like six fabulous trails. And birding, if you're birding, they have night walks. Uh, you can listen to the bats. Uh, we have Danny Ortiz, who's head of the BLM. Danny's got these devices that you can hear the bats and she takes you on a night walk. And uh, the Coachella Valley Preserve, easy, intermediate, and cardio type hikes at the preserve. San Andreas Fault starts down at the Salton Sea, about half, so about halfway uh, up the Salton Sea, the San Andreas Fault starts, and it goes up to about Gulf Center Parkway to Fantasy Springs, and then it splits. And on the right-hand side, it's the North American Tectonic Plate, the Mission Creek branch of the San Andreas Fault. On the left-hand side, it's the Banning Creek branch of the San Andreas Fault. So it splits, and these two tectonic plates moving and sliding together, San Andreas is a right lateral strike slip fault. It moves like this. This plate that we're on, the Pacific plate, is moving northwest towards San Francisco about as fast as your fingernail grows, about an inch and a half per year. In 1924, when LA City Hall was built, it's now nine feet closer to San Francisco. If you've ever been up to Joshua Tree, 20 million years ago, Joshua Tree was just outside of Los Angeles near the San Gabriel Mountains. It's moved about 120 plus miles in the last 20 million years. So this is a slip fault. It moves like this. It's not like in the San Fernando Valley, the Northridge earthquake, you know, that is a thrust fault, boom. So this one slips. We're in pretty good shape here. I don't know about Sun City because uh, we're one of the higher liquefaction areas, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> the Santa Rosa, San Jacinto, the Peninsula Mountain Range, that's about a 900 mile rain shadow mountain. It starts at San Gorgonio, where the wind farms are at, and it almost goes all the way down to Cabo San Lucas, okay? So what we get on the top of the mountain range, 30 to 40 inches of precipitation. When it comes over the clouds, we get about four to five inches a year on the valley floor, typically. 
So if it wasn't for that rain shadow mountain, we wouldn't be a desert like we are. And the moral of the story is, and I won't elaborate on this, but the San Jacinto Santa Rosa mountain range is an intrusive mountain range. It wasn't created by volcanic activity. There's a long time ago, 150 million years ago, during Jurassic, we had volcanoes. Today, those mountains are only about two to three million years old, and they were intrusive. So, you go to Friends of the Desert Mountains. They have fabulous volunteers. The docents there, free hikes. You look at their website, Friends of the Desert Mountains, and we want to preserve, you know, the Santa Rosa San Jacinto National Monument, just under 300,000 acres. So we have people, weed warriors, they go out there, uh, you know, make sure the trails are in good shape. Then we have hike leaders that do interpretive hikes, and we have all kinds of programs for the younger generation to, to learn about nature and history and geology. And then the Living Desert, one of the top 10 living desert zoos and gardens in the United States. This is a fabulous place. Come Christmas, over a million lights. So from like six o'clock at night, Sharon, how, how many years have you been there? 20 years. Sharon's volunteer here. Since night, incredible. So there's the volunteers there, they have the best training of any nonprofit that I know of for training their, their volunteers. And uh, so there's three girls, our three girl cheetahs. And then Shields, you know about Shields. Prior to COVID, man, you could have lunch. You know, Hannibal was able to cross the Alps because he had dates, dates and goat's milk. Uh, and so dates are very high in protein. Little Lake Kauia, now it's Veterans Park. You can go there and fish. They have like bluegill and catfish and they stock it with trout. So that's just up Jefferson. Then we have a little museum. It's a little museum off of uh, Madison. Yeah, no, off of Monroe and Miles. I have a fabulous museum there tells you the whole history, primarily of the southeastern portion of our desert. You know, we have two major contributors to our economy. Number one, tourism. Number two, agriculture. Dates, grapes, lemons, limes, over 80 different varieties of agricultural products. So between Coachella and Imperial, we generate over four billion dollars a year from our agricultural products. Everything you want to know about the East Valley, South Valley, at this museum, it is fabulous. That, that, when they were building the railroad in 1876, 1877, Southern Pacific, at night they didn't have air conditioning. So they would put, they called this a submarine, they put burlap sacks over the submarine, and then they drip water on it. So it was about 20 degrees cooler inside the submarine for the people that were working on the railroad. Ah, ladders, this is cardio. You get into Mecca, Painted Hills, um, you know, there's some nice easy walks, but uh, ladders is a cardio uh, hike. You know, if you want exercise, that's a good place. And the mountains are, just absolutely gorgeous. Oasis in, in Mecca, great date shades, wonderful place to visit. The Salton Sea, the largest 218,000 acres of wetlands, over 400 plus species of birds that migrate from Canada and from South America up to the Salton Sea I could spend a whole day talking about the Colorado River and the Salton Sea and ancient Lake Cahuilla. The only thing that I wanna say about the Salton Sea 
is that right now we're not happy campers. We need water. We need more water. I believe the only way we're going to be able to permanently fix the sea is sea to sea. We have to go through the Sea of Cortez. That's the most logical route. You read the paper, there's disagreements with that. But the moral of the story is I don't care how many billions of dollars you give to me. If I'm living in the desert and I don't have any water, it's not going to work for me. So the moral of the story is there's a lot of very wealthy corporations that know the federal and state government will not allow the sea to die. The salinity level of the sea right now, the particulate matter coming off, the health, the environment, and the economy are our three major challenges that have to be fixed. And a lot of people, a lot of companies have bought property down there, pennies on the dollar, knowing that the federal government and the state of California, see in 2003, the state said, we will take responsibility for when you transfer water to San Diego in 2018, we'll take responsibility for the sea. The state of California has not taken responsibility as they promised in the quantification settlement agreement in 2003. And the state and federal both need to combine their effort because it's a very costly. We're talking billions and billions of dollars, but it's gonna be many more billions if they can't fix it for health care and the economy and our environment with the birds. Anyway, that's what it used to look like in the 50s and 60s. Man, more people visited here. This was the Western Riviera than, than visit Yosemite. So this was absolutely fantastic. Ancient Lake Cahuilla dried up around, oh, what, 300, 400 years ago. Uh, Ancient Lake Cahuilla was created by the uh, Colorado River changing course. You know, we're 235 feet below sea level at the Salton Sea. We go to 10,834 at the top of Mount San Jacinto. We are living in the most biologically diverse desert in the world. The Sonoran Desert is the most biologically diverse desert in the world. And the little microorganisms up to the black bear, to the peninsula bighorn sheep, uh, to the mountain lion, to the mule deer, they all have to adapt to tremendous you know, variances in climate and, and uh, altitude. So anyway, uh, if you go into La Quita, you dig, you put your hand in the, in the sand, dig down about a foot, you come up with the little clam shells, the little freshwater shells. Sonny Bono, you know, Sonny and Newt Gingrich, when Sonny was alive in the 1990s, uh, Sonny and Newt were really advocates to save the Salton Sea. And when Sonny, you know, was killed in that skiing accident, and then Newt was very involved, you know, back east, um, then they, we didn't have any major, major players to advocate for the Salton Sea, uh, but they honored Sonny with the Salton Sea Refuge. And that's one of the number one birding destinations in the world too. And then Obsidian Butte. Has anybody been to Obsidian Butte? We have geothermal plants down there because there's hot geothermal magma within two miles of the surface. Uh, because of the tectonic plates and the cracks in the earth. This obsidian, you know, that black glass, uh, just to the left of the Sunny Bono Preserve is Obsidian Butte. Great big boulders of obsidian, that black glass. And then on the right is the mud volcanoes. We still have volcanism taking place down there in the Salton Sea. And then we have the Salvation Mountain. Leonard Knight, you know, he passed away several years ago, but this is world famous. Uh, matter of fact, um, Slab City is out there, and that property is owned by the State Teachers Retirement System, but people come out there, they live out there for free, they come out during the winter, and they camp out there in their motorhomes, and 
It's and and then people they donate paint to help maintain Salvation Mountain. And look at the water line on the right. Ancient Lake Kauia was about 300 feet deep. We only have two seasons: heaven and hell. 350 days of sunshine. And this book on the left, Greg Neiman, who wrote this book, it's available on Amazon and at the Palm Springs Historical Society. It is one of the, it's my number one on bibli my bib bibliography, number one. And Frank Bogert's, you know, first hundred years, that's like my number two, go to. Uh, they're absolutely fabulous books, Palm Springs Legends. And then I wrote two books. I wrote one, this one, You're Not Alone, Our Journey, God's Destination. You know, my wife passed away on her 25th anniversary from leukemia in 03. And, you know, you talk to other friends and you say, hey, this is my situation. Why does this just happen to me? And you, they go, no, Ray, it, it kind of happened to me too, similar. So I put, you're not alone. Our journey, God's destination. I wrote it primarily for my grandchildren to, they live in the Dominican Republic. My son is a pastor, 13 years. My sister is a Jewish cantor. I've got all the holidays covered, let me tell you. So I gave you kind of a snapshot of Enchanted Valley, Palm Springs, and beyond. Uh, I wanted that, you know, I wanted to, I pay $6. As the author, I pay $6 for the author's copy, and then I sell it for 20, and then 14, I split $7 to Oswald Land Trust and $7 to Palm Springs Historical Society. If you buy it like on Amazon, I get maybe like six or seven dollars, and then I split it in half, not that much money to donate. So I've got some at, at the back here, if you're interested, I did it in color. It has about 40 some odd different places. And we're going through some difficult times, so let me end with this. Don't quit now when things go wrong, as they sometimes will when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. You see, life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us learns, and many a fellow turns about when they might have won had they stuck it out. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt, and you can never tell how close you are. You may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem the worst that we must not quit. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Wow, guys. Thank you. Shalom Aleichem, Feliz Navidad and Prosper Año Nuevo, and uh, Happy New Year.